Hey, good morning, everyone. I think we're going to get started. Uh, thanks for being able to join us uh, this morning. My name is Alyssa Ayers, and I'm Dean of the Elliott School, and I'm so happy to be able to welcome you all to what I think is going to be uh, an important and provocative and very serious conversation uh, about women and Western engagement with women in Afghanistan. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I'd like to recognize the philanthropic legacy that has allowed us to welcome her to the Elliott School. Uh, the J.B. and Maurice C. Shapiro Professorship was established in 1992 by the J.B. and Maurice C. Shapiro Foundation. And uh, this fellowship appoints esteemed figures in the fields of international affairs and diplomacy to teaching positions at the Elliott School. Former Shapiro visiting scholars have included Navy Admiral Michelle Howard, who broke multiple barriers, becoming the first woman to achieve four-star rank and the first African-American woman to captain a ship. We've also hosted as the Shapiro Scholar, the Shapiro Professor Ambassador John Negroponte, a career diplomat who served under three administrations as Ambassador, Deputy Secretary of State, and Director of National Intelligence, a leading scholar on in international diplomatic affairs. Today, it is my honor to introduce all of you to the Elliott School's current Shapiro Professor, Mukadesa Yorish. Professor Yorish's personal journey to the United States began, as I think many of you know, when the former Afghan government collapsed and the Taliban seized power in August a year ago, forcing Ms. Yorish and her family to flee the country. Ms. Yorish is a former deputy minister for commerce and industry of the previous government of Afghanistan. Her experience includes service as a commissioner on Afghanistan's National Civil Service Reform Commission, uh, and as Human Resources Director of the Municipality of Kabul, so she has served at state, local, national levels of government. Her expertise spans international trade and commerce, governance, economic development and reform, human capital, and strategic communications. Ms. Yorish is a frequent commentator on Afghanistan's political scene. She is a passionate advocate for women and girls and a champion for Afghanistan's citizens. Her writings appeared in the New York Times. She has been featured as a Vital Voices leader uh, back in October a year ago, and she sat down with former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in 2021 to share her perspective about the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan and its meaning for women and girls in the country. Just a few months ago, she was recognized uh, as among the 10 women from Afghanistan recognized with the International DBF Award, which and I quote here, honors 10 women who are shining a light from all over the world to ensure a safe and sustainable future for the most at-risk Afghan women and girls. Ms. Yurish received both of her degrees through scholarship programs abroad, earning her bachelor's degree of economics from the University of Pune in India and obtaining a master's degree in business management in the United States from the University of Akron, which she attended as a Fulbright scholar. Today, she is going to speak on the topic of Afghan women's rights. I think you all know, 20 years after they were driven out by US troops, the Taliban uh, are back and they have cracked down on women's rights, banning most women from working and prohibiting girls from attending secondary school. More than 90% of the population suffers from food insecurity, so you layer this on top of a, an already existing humanitarian situation. Uh, Professor Yorish is going to apply a critical analysis and bring her important perspective to this question. So we are looking forward to your remarks and to the conversation which will follow. Just as a housekeeping note, before I welcome Professor Yorish up to the podium, uh, she will deliver remarks, then we will have a brief moderated conversation, followed by a Q&A with the audience. So feel free to enjoy the refreshments that we have in the back of the room uh, during the course of our conversation today. Uh, and just one final note, this session is being recorded and it will appear on the Elliott School's YouTube channel. With that, let me welcome Professor Yorish to the podium. Thank you, Dean Eris, um, and a warm welcome to everyone. Um, it's great to see some um, friends, family, and colleagues in the audience after a long time. Uh, I'm sure um, I cannot really see the screen, but I'm sure uh, we have friends and uh, colleagues online as well. 
It's a pleasure um, to be able to speak to you um, about the women of my country and the many demands placed on our rights through the various landscapes of war, foreign intervention, and post 9 11 reconstruction. And if I can add more recently, the gender apartheid that's happening back home, and of course, the, for those of us in exile, what we are suffering here. Ironically, um, as I was preparing for this lecture, I realized this is a very difficult topic for me to talk about, to decolonize and de-victimize myself when I never really thought of myself as one and I never was one. Growing up, I never grappled with the notion of agency and nor did I pursue it consciously. My generation of women grew up observing my, our mothers and the women before them exercise different patterns of agency in the complex backdrop of our socio-political history. These women carried out complex negotiations on a daily basis and navigated a rigid social order, whether it was at home, school, or workplace. Now, I have to say that when I talk of agency in this context, it doesn't always connect to well-being. So some of those decisions that the woman made, particularly in the backdrop of what was happening in the country socially and politically, these were just choices for survival. Um, and I gave you this insight from the conversations I've had you know, with my mother, with my grandmother, with three different um, generations of women in my family who had to navigate these complex social and at least on one occasion, I remember my mother navigating this behind the blue veil. So agency was always omnipresent in our lives. And it manifested itself in the way Afghan women navigated their complex contexts and in the ownership of their decisions. Meanwhile, in the West, the timeless image of the Afghan woman with a blue veil became a generic portrait of Afghan women as passive victims of war. And even today, um, standing here in front of you, um, I have had encounters of people asking me if I was really an Afghan woman because I didn't fit the image of the Afghan woman with the under uh, uh, with the blue veil and the passive uh, victim of war. When the international community arrived in Afghanistan in 2001, this timeless image and the status of women under the brutal Taliban regime displaced the need for a deeper engagement and a deeper understanding with the changing political and social configurations of our country. The presence of women in the political, cultural, and economic spaces in the decades before the Taliban rule and the history of their progress and the face of global injustices that women were facing all around the globe were never considered as our indigenous collective experience that needed to be recalled and expanded. Instead, the plight of Afghan women was reincarnated to provide momentum to the counterinsurgency doctrine and provide a human right justification for the military intervention of Pakistan. As a result, Afghan woman was reduced to a victim of oppression in need of empowerment by the West. Now this brings me to empowerment. Empowerment in the case of Afghan woman was never viewed as expanding the scope of their already existing agents. Earlier we spoke about, you know, how agency as a notion existed in our lives and always didn't necessarily connect to our being. So empowerment in case of Afghan women was never viewed as expanding the scope of their already existing agency, but rather it took the power out and employed a connotation of empowerment that positioned Western intervention as liberatory and at times uh, culturally alienating for the Afghans. 
The focus was also more on establishing the means of empowerment. For example, school buildings, a separate ministry of women affairs, gender units inside all our public institutions. The focus was on all these um, mechanisms than the degree to which women were empowered by these measures. And this gave many false positive readings of empowerment. Now, what followed such misconceptions of empowerment was a series of contradictions, ambiguities, and unintended liberation projects that at times embedded violence and further discrimination in the development discourse of our hearts. Now, I can give you an example here from a personal encounter I had when I was working at the Ministry of um, Commerce as a deputy minister. The Ministry of Women Affairs of Afghanistan, which I always didn't think we needed one, because it cornered the agenda of women into a particular um, ministry. They had a donor project that required them to establish um, a gender coordination committee. And we and each ministry had to send a member from the ministry to this gender coordination committee. And obviously, because of the underlying connotation of of how gender was perceived back then, this particular person from the ministry had to be a woman. And because this was a high level committee, most of the ministries who had a woman deputy minister, they introduced the woman deputy ministers to be members of the committee. So I was asked once a week at least to go and sit in the meetings that I didn't think brought much change uh, to the cause of our home. I um, started not going. And then this was escalated by this particular donor at the cabinet level. And I was perceived as someone who didn't support the cause of woman empowerment. In now, the reason I didn't go, because I had two specific reasons I didn't want to go to this committee. First, I was a deputy minister for commerce and I had a technical um, portfolio. So the, my other male colleagues who were also deputy, they didn't have to waste um, two hours of commute navigating the cobble traffic to go to the Ministry of Women Affairs and sit in a useless meeting just to pick a, a donor project box because then I had to also come back and attend to my real work, which was the technical work that was required for my portfolio. So when this was um, elevated to the cabinet level, I asked them that why were just women deputy ministers um, expected to be part of these uh, committees, that I was ready to uh, be part of this committee if I could uh, do this on a rotation basis with my male colleagues so that the male deputy ministers could also get an exposure to the important issue of gender. I will leave that there. Another heavily funded beauty salon in Kabul employed Western notions of femininity and makeup consumption as requirements for women's empowerment and emancipation. Now, the consequences of such Orientalist and victim center view of Afghan women have been far reach and, in fact, deadly in the context of what's happening back home. These misconceptions have undermined Afghan women's political agency and reduced them to victims at the mercy of foreign donors. It has also branded the agenda of women's rights as foreign rather than a continuation of a long indigenous battle for emancipation. Now, I became very conscious of my agency and my heart and progress when the US started talking peace to the Taliban, but also earlier, you know, when I started getting more involved in this 
development structures and I realized that I was being viewed as an object of intervention. And the person that I was, was labeled as the gain and progress of the Western intervention. I never saw myself as one. I used to say I would wake up every morning to go to work, be a deputy minister, do the work of my portfolio that I was sure would benefit not only every woman in that country, but also men and children. But also indirectly, I was serving the agenda of women empowerment, right? Because I walked into those rooms full of men and I made my points there and I challenged the notion of women leadership in a, in, in a um, society like Afghans. So that's when I became very conscious of my agency. And I realized how I was viewed by the West. Now, in the context of these talks, our Western allies building on their misconceptions were quick to delegitimize Afghan women's progress by reducing it to a gift bestowed to us by the West. And Afghan women's rights were conveniently labeled as an internal agenda and left at the mercy of the complex political situation that we were dealing with. Back then. The situation really puzzled. You know, I, if, if for one minute I want to assume that my plight or my liberation was the base for was the, the base for Western intervention in Afghanistan, and I and, you know, and I would take that as a, at its face value, then what had changed then? Why was everyone conveniently labeling this as an internal agenda. And also, if I was an ob as an ob object of the Western intervention, and I was the gain and progress of the 20 years of the Western investment in Afghanistan, why did I quickly become delegitimized as somebody who was an urban contemporary Afghan woman that didn't represent the woman of Again, to take the interventions at its face, while well, wasn't that supposed to be the whole purpose of quote unquote woman empowerment? I was an empowered woman, right? But I did not fit the timeless image of Afghan woman. Now, the unfolding gender property back in Afghanistan today <clears throat> has an element of reprisal. Avon women invested heavily in the post 9-11 structure and embraced its opportunities despite all its ambiguities and contradictory policies. In fact, the international community in my dealings when I was in the government emerged as another stakeholder that I had to learn to know. But after the peace talks and withdrawal of the American forces, the rights of Avon women are now seen as the remnants of a Western-led order, incompatible with the political and religious worldview of the time. And when I talk of this element of reprisal, that's exactly what's happening. Whoever rises to demand their rights, they're being labeled as spy of the West, put into jail, kidnap, women are disappearing back home. So there is clearly, as a result of these misconceptions, an element of retaliation in why the Taliban are treating the women of Afghanistan as they are doing right. Now, as the Taliban continue to tighten its grip on power and limit the right of women, it hurts me to see that mischaracterization of Afghan women still continues. We all have retreated back to the timeless image of the Afghan woman. You don't see an image of me sitting in the cabinet on mass media, do you? No, because that doesn't offer the currency of greed. That, that matters so much when it comes to the politics of gender and the geopolitical interests of the current political world. And I believe that such mischaracterization of the women of Afghanistan and their 
endogenous progress in the last two decades. I want to emphasize using an, um, using the opportunities and embracing the opportunities that were made available by the international community's presence continues to be counterproductive. I will leave it there and uh, I'm hoping that you will have questions for me. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. move over for the discussion portion of the program. I'll be monitoring uh, Zoom. You can, our colleagues who are participating online, please feel free to ask questions via the chat. I'll be able to see this. Q &A. Uh, sorry, oh, yeah. Q &A. So questions through the Q&A correction. Uh, well, thank you, Professor Yurish. Uh, lived up to the promise of a provocative uh, uh, lecture for us to think about. Um, I, I think as we let me bring this back to thinking about policy from the perspective of, of where we are in Washington, D.C., um, when we read the news from Afghanistan, it hasn't been good, as you're so, so intimately aware. And I think that we do have a lot of questions of, of what so I'd love to hear more from you. Despite these contradictions, is there something we can do that would be helpful? What would be the best way to be helpful? Um, thank you, Dean Ellis. Um, before I go there, I have to, you know, mention that despite all these contradictions and you know ambiguities that I talk about in this very room. There are people who have not only seen that agency, but acknowledge, and they have been there for me. Dean uh, Iris, you and my American family here in the back, um, Kate and Rob, who um, did see that agency and who didn't necessarily have you know, such, a, such a timeless understanding uh, of the woman that I just described, or Avance for that matter. So I just wanted to to begin with acknowledging that. And, um, I think that that's a question that we are all grappling with, and it's not an easy question. There's also no magic spell, uh, you know, to, to the situation back home, I acknowledge. Um, but I think what I'm seeing, the policy trend that I'm seeing, again, in relation to Afghanistan, unfortunately continues to rest on these men's misconceptions. And it makes me wonder, did we ever take the time to look back and see what went so fundamentally wrong that we were back to square one? Um, and I think I have at least made it my mission to make sure that in whatever capacity I have, I can raise some awareness about that as somebody who has lived uh, through, uh, uh, through this period, but who also um, comes from that country and understands that any solution that we hope to find for the situation in Afghanistan cannot be, cannot be taken unless and until we apply a social, political, historical context. Um, and I think that's unfortunately what is happening is that people still continue to not do their part when proposing these uh, policies. Um, and I believe that is one of one of the things that I would urge um, everyone to, uh, to to take into consideration. The other thing, as recently as last week, there was a high level delegation of the UN that went back home trying to negotiate our rights. You know, and there was this particular tweet that caught my attention and I went, oh no, of uh, a deputy secretary general who's a woman herself calling for not, you know, helping Afghan women gain access to their rights, but essentially 
the tone of the Tweed employee that we wanted to bring these rights home to us. And this conversation happened, you know, inside a closed uh, only woman room, which again, um, something that I completely despised when I was back home was that the woman right agenda was always treated as a woman only issue. And then when we would come out of these conversations, you know, after having talked to these several VVIPs who came from the West to talk to us about our rights, we came out of these, these meeting rooms and there was always our male colleagues looking at us, so what did you guys talk about? <laughs> you know, inside that room. So there was always also an element of what are the foreigners teaching the African? Um, so I think it's important to to acknowledge that these conversations need to happen together with our main colleagues. So for them to also understand you know, that this is not just an issue of women, you know, but it's a broader issue that is connected to the well-being of the economy and to the well-being of the society. So I think for me, just to see that language continue to exist and the discourse. Uh, and the development, or for that matter, the humanitarian discourse is a little you know, disheartened. And so on. As much as I understand, you know, there's a lot of good intention, I agree. But I think this good intention has an underlining assumption, which has remained timeless throughout these, you know, different episodes of foreign intervention, is that assumes no agency, not only for Afghan women, but Afghan in general, you know, and doesn't really under tries to understand the complexity of our social political order and the context that we see. And I think that is something that we continue to apply. Um, a general portrait and an oversimplification of the Afghan society, it ends up over-determining our politics. It ends up over-determining this politics. And I think that's exactly what, what is continuing to happen. And I, you know, as a delegitimized Afghan woman, I don't necessarily, you know, I, I, I clearly see that from where I am standing, you know, that, that my rights and the future of my country is being overdetermined because of this general portrait or this general lens that is applied to all Afghan as a tribal group. You know, so I think it goes a little bit beyond just what it's happening to the woman, but also, you know, how we view that country and that part of the region. I was going to ask a follow-up, but we have, um, in fact, it's directly relevant to Q&A just came in a question in, um, on Zoom that says, thank you for this. This is from a Jean-Marc Bernard. Thanks for this stimulating lecture. Do you think the pattern you describe with foreign support for Afghan women applies for other areas of support? In a sense, could your criticism expand to foreign aid in general? So you began to speak a little bit about this. Yeah, I think that I think it's um, I think it's part of the development discourse in general. You know, the language that is embedded in the development discourse it doesn't necessarily start and end in Afghanistan, but I think it's also part of the bigger agenda of state building um, that also, as you all these countries that, that get intervened as intervenable objects, you know, as if something is wrong with these countries and it can only be fixed through a Western intervention. And I think this is a pattern that has, that has not only happened um, in Afghanistan, but it's, in, it, you know, it's happened elsewhere around the world. But the case of Afghanistan, because of its you know, very complex social political history, I think it becomes a unique case of itself, but I think it's, um, and I think the part that's very interesting for me is that when it gets tied to state, you know, that we assume that creating a national momentum around these development discourses is what is the right formula and will fix the problem. So I think if you look at it, if you zoom out, it can be applied to the general development and also the overall um, doctrine of intervention. 
in intervenable countries that we need to be uh, without really acknowledging that. And I and I remember the Eros, you and I had this conversation where I did, didn't I have a problem? I started having a problem with this entire conflict resolution doctrine because sometimes there's we feel like there was no conflict about the or resolved. But then, because we were seen as this inconvenable object, we were forced to believe that there's a conflict. So all these conflict resolution um, tools were applied to a situation that was just a complex social political, you know, um, situation that probably required indigenous solutions that not, and, and, and the, the local people were not necessarily seen. So I think. This lens can be, if you zoom it out and take it just, you know, that from the woman's issue, it can be applied to the, the, the um, policy, uh, to the development of this course in, in general. Well, let me follow that up. Um, and, and again, any questions here, please, we're happy to take them live. Uh, let me follow up. What would be, in your view, a more optimal kind of engagement and support for rights for Afghan women? What would that look like? I think that... Are you calling for a disconnection entirely? No, I, no, I don't think I'm calling for a disconnection. I'm calling for an equality in the search, for an acknowledgement of the woman's right, of the Afghan woman's dignity and agency first, and then moving on. Because there's a complex principle agency scenario here as well. And, and I felt that was my bones when I was dealing with the donor projects in the government. You know, there was a very complex donor, and that's what I said, you know, I have to learn how to navigate that dynamics, you know, is that there's a complex, and there's an inherent inequality in that relationship, and there's a complex principal agent dynamics. But I think, uh, unless and until you address that, it just becomes difficult to really try to, you know, view it in a, in a more holistic way and in a way that a real intervention can actually have, make the, the lives of women better than just, you know, making it more complicated. So I think that's really important. Now that also requires, and this is not only up to the West, I think that also requires a lot of work on the part of the countries who are dealing with the situation, which does include my country, Afghanistan. And I think what was so um, unique about this generation of Afghans, you know, the post 9-11, that we grew with that. We saw how it shaped our lives. We also saw that how fragile our progress was and that how it could be taken away in a matter of a second. So I think we, our generation, I'm happy to see, you know, I have colleagues here, I'm sitting in the room here, that we have had this conversation. How do we make this relationship work? You know, what is it that we have to do on our part to make sure that we are perceived as a more credible and dignified party in this equality? And then I think hopefully that will shape. Um, you know, a more healthier discourse on allowing other countries to pursue their democratic or emancipation aspirations in a healthier way. So, I mean, there's no question of, I don't question the intention. That's something that I just want to, you know, make clear that, there, that the intention has always, um, especially on the part of Afghan women, that there have always been um, um, the intention for well-being. You know, but sometimes, again, from the conversations I've had with the woman of my, with the woman in my family, who was, you know, and some of them are still back home, is that they, you know, it's about their ages, and sometimes that agency might not necessarily connect to their short-term well-being right away, but in the long term, that, but are we really seeing it from that, or are we just putting a Western lens to it that? you know, looks at it from where the West is standing. Um, a, a follow up on this, and 
millions of Afghans are now living in exile. Mm -hmm. Tens of thousands of Afghans who had been political and civil society leaders under the former government and who had experienced this generation that you are part of, experienced mm -hmm. this 20 years mm -hmm. of uh, uh, that feeling of to be what you chose to be. Yeah. Um, how does the community in exile think about ways to address this question given what's in front of them? That's a good question. I think it's the community hasn't really come into terms um, for a lot of what, what has happened. So it's still it's still so fresh. You know, sometimes I wake up every morning and I feel like Kobo Kelly yesterday. You know, it's been a a year more than a year and a half, but it's so fresh in our memories. And I think a lot of us are still dealing with you know the personal trauma um, of that as much as. You know, we're also trying to take care of our families both here, but also back home. So there's a personal, um, just dealing with refugee, hold on, with exile, you know, and itself is not an, an easy process. So I think uh, I would say, you know, these discussions are happening in smaller communities. So I at least haven't really seen a larger mobilization of this um, exiled community um, at a level that could, you know, lead to something maybe concrete in the near future. But there's one thing I have to say, you know, there's something that makes this generation or this community very different from the other communities that have come before us, for example. You know, I always, when I was back home, I resented the idea of being a diaspora. Uh, you know, I, I still don't, uh, I still, and I'm an exiled Afghan refugee. I find it hard to see myself in the pattern becoming a diaspora. But I do know that this is not the first time that Afghans have become refugees through these you know, different episodes of state collapse and formation. But I think one thing that makes this generation different is that we were not, that many of the generations in the Afghan history that became exiled as a result of a state collapse were elites. Um, either in the political circles or because of their heritage, we nature of their relationship with the government, you know. The, so there was always an element of an elitehood that also allowed them to not necessarily prosper in exile, but you know, not be as mis miserable or have a miserable experience of refugee but as this generation. You know, but also an understanding and also I think it's the first generation of our on the terms through our engagements with the uh, international community and the world in the past 20 years, we understand the language of the global politics and the inner workings of it. You know? um, so I think those are some of the things, being Iris, that makes me hopeful. I hate that helps me keep, I call it my stubborn hope. You know, that, that it helps me wake up every day and as fresh as that pain is, I can see that it's a face. And that once we get through this pain, we whatever we have lost, that no one can take away that, that experience of that 20 years of engagement with our community, you know, and what we have come to, and what we have been able to turn that into. So I guess that's, um, you know, I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I know we have questions here. Um, we have a mic coming around. Professor Graham. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Thank you so much, Makadasa, for your um, really stimulating uh, remarks and the conversation you're having now with Dean Ayers. So I'd just like to pick up on this particular thread in terms of the diaspora, but also ref you know, the, the focus on being a refugee in another country. And I know you work with Open Society and that you have been, you know, really stimulating discussions about um, refugee settlement. So going back to the points you're making around gender and kind of focusing in particular ways that aren't necessarily helpful or can be very unhelpful. I'm wondering, you know, what, could you tell us a bit more about um, your experience as a refugee here in the US? How are women's voices and women's agency being brought into this process, uh, how are women being consulted with, and how are they 
um, informing the process. And I suppose I'd also like to know about, is it a trauma-informed process? And what are the psychosocial supports there for the entire um, population of Afghans who are refugees here? Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Graham. That's a very comprehensive question. Well, it has many layers. Let me start by telling you about this conversation I had with a um, U.S. Marine who was involved you know, in the process of um, evacuations uh, of, of the Afghans, and she um, she said she was um, she was amazed that once the Afghans um, arrived in in the camps, you know, on the, the makeshift camps, essentially, where we had to go through some processing work. She was amazed at how some women choose to just quickly remove their veils and also, you know, be more comfortable with who they were. And she said, I had this conversation with my other woman colleagues, and I said, wow, we liberated them. And of course, this, you know, this, this particular conversation happened in a context, you know, where, the, where I was exactly addressing this, you know, liberation doctrine. And then she said, you, she said, allow me to look at this differently. Help me look at this. Differently. And then I told her, listen, do you think I just happened to get on that plane? No. I and every woman who got on that plane, we had a choice to. Right? And I think this is where the question of agency, that I had a choice to make that whether I wanted to live or whether I wanted to you know, either die in Afghanistan or, or be underground. Right? So I made the, the choice of living. So I, 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 and I knew what it would bring me the moment I stepped foot on that plane, right? That what was waiting for me. But I think then what, what surprised me, and I, and I remember when we were like one of the first planes that arrived in, in Bahrain, and, um, and my, my, my father was a little sick, and I remember the moment we landed, there were a lot of like, journalists who had surrounded the, uh, the plane because they wanted to take the pictures of the first arriving refugees. So I am um, obviously, you know, the pandemic was still there. So I had a mask on and I am, um, the moment that the plane landed, we had to evacuate my father first because of health, his health condition. And there were like flashes everywhere. I didn't want it. You know, I, there was no other way for me to communicate this, but I put my hand like this and I told everyone, and I was essentially telling the journalists no pictures. And right there, you know, I felt like, what are these journalists assuming? That just because I'm a refugee, I have no agency? That I was a working woman until yesterday, I was a boss sitting in an office, you know, leading a company? That I don't even have today the agency of like, asking people not to take my picture in this situation because I don't want the picture, right? So I guess, you know, I, and then I obviously, I took care of my dad. I went back to the journalist and I deleted each one of those pictures. Because I felt like, do you guys ask me? And they will say, no, I said, okay, you delete those pictures because I don't want them in the first page of the newspaper the next morning. You know? but, and then, of course, and, and then I think that, that that struggle with agency was then in, in a new form. I have experienced it here in the US. You know, I've had someone say to me, oh, you're not a refugee. You have a ring. You have your jewelry. And I have, so it's very, you know, if you go into the depths of it, you know, I think it's very, that's, and I think that's why I have really this focus on empowerment and agency as part of my, you know, intellectual and, and, and academic India was, you know, has become the highlight of that because of these personal you know, um, experiences that I, that I have uh, gone through. Um, and, I, and then when, you know, just like every step of the way, and then when I, well, of course, we arrived in that base and there was so much going on, 13,000 people, you know, and uh, my, I activated my business management degree. We had to manage 13,000 people, right? And I spoke the language, I know how to do it. And I had done this before in a complex situation in Afghanistan. 
So, you know, I became part of this task force that would help um, the, uh, the army and all the other officials manage the camp. And then moving on from there, you know, I had to, I arrived in Silver Spring and then I had to find a job. And I had this first interview over the phone with an employment um, agent who asked me, uh, you know, tell me about your background. And I told him all my background and that I was a deaf minister. I, and I was a commissioner for the civil service commission. I was director of this and that. And then he went to the next question and he asked me, so what are your skills? <laughs> I told him, listen, what skills do you take? Do you think it takes to be a deputy minister in Afghanistan? Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, the job that I was offered was to be a um, cashier at Target. So, and then of course the Open Society project was born from that because I, you know, and I say, yeah, you know, this this struggle that I have been through, I think it's important that we embed Afghan voices in the resettlement process. Because throughout this process, there were many occasions when people never asked me what I really needed and they just give me things that I didn't need, assuming that I need them. So, and there's always, again, the, the well intentioned. So I said, and that's how the project was born to just help um, understand, to just um, help give this middle class, uh, this mid level career and high level uh, pro and career uh, professionals an opportunity to apply their skills in a relevant job here in the US, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to say that now we first did a mapping and I'm happy to say that now there's actually an employment program that's born out of that that links uh, some host institutions you know, with advanced with certain skills and expertise. So um, thank you for asking that. Uh, and I, I, I think my <laughs> there's a lot about agency in my personal journey that I've also encountered with, uh, throughout this resettlement process. Let me go to uh, one of the questions that's come in from our um, participants online. This is from um, Samyudha Rajesh. The question is, what do you think is the role of Afghanistan's, Afghanistan's neighboring states, Pakistan, Iran, even India? Where do they fit in the plight of women in the non-Western world? Is there a sense of communion between the state? I don't think it's a... Uh... That's a good question, but I don't think it's a right demand to put on the woman in the region. Why should there be a sense of community? Right? I think the very character, one of the important character of political work requires you to have different different takes. And when men have that, it's called competition. <laughs> but when we but when women have it, I think there's a term for it here in the US as well. I don't want to say it, but you know, back home in Afghanistan, they call it violence of women against women. And I love that term <laughs> because it employed something strong there, you know, that the women have the capability to employ violence against each other. That says something about women, right? And their capability, even if that necessarily connects in a, to their well being in a positive way. But I think I don't necessarily, the very character of political work, I think, requires you to have different stands and opinions so I don't necessarily and I, I and I do understand that you know women who work in these neighboring countries also have their own national interests at heart just like many other male politicians you know? and, and I think our geographic uh, location in the region hasn't really made it that easy for us to deal um, with our neighbors and, and I always um, felt like we were at this a strategic disadvantage, for example, in the many conversations that I would sit across, for example, my Pakistani counterparts when we were uh, negotiating the trade and transit agreement between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, I realized that as much as we wanted to treat that as a pure economic transaction, it was always overshadowed by the bigger policy, by the bigger political situation of what was happening. I've said across my Chinese counterparts. Um, and so then I had to bring in the lens of, okay, we are an ally to, to the US. How does that relationship between the US and China work? So how do I navigate my relationship with my Chinese counterparts? 
that is, uh, you know, the thematic, but it also, you know, there's always that in the back of my mind, consciously, the principal agent complexity of like being an ally to the Western world. Um, and I think this complexity is very much understood by the countries and the region. They also have their own national interests, you know, that they follow. And I think the thing that bothers me about, and, and, and particularly in relation to Afghan women, the thing that bothers me is that for some reason Afghan women case has become very convenient to mold in whatever way to do. And I think that's where exactly I keep bringing in the, the question of agency, that when it was, that when it served the agenda of counterinsurgency, our plight was leveraged. But then once we, we, we were empowered and it didn't necessarily serve the political context of the talks with the Taliban, we were delegitimized, right? And now back, we are back to the plight of the Afghan. So I think for me, that's where I feel like, you know, we need to, we need to find a balance. And a lot of that work, I, I also have to acknowledge that a lot of that work is also on the, on the shoulder of as a Afghan woman. But also, I saw many of my peers struggling to navigate this situation at home, you know, and they felt like they fit further into that agenda and those misconceptions. Because that's where the discourse was going, that's where the, mo the money was, the funding was, that's where the project was. Right? So I saw my peers engaging with that type of things, either consciously or subconsciously. So I think I do want to acknowledge that there is work that needs to be done on the part of the Afghan woman as well, you know, which I hope I'm <laughs> trying to do that today. So, um, uh, in order to be able to, you know, give them a different picture uh, of the Afghan woman. First of all, thank you so much, Professor uh, Yuri, for your uh, uh, informative lecture. And uh, my question is, uh, how do you see uh, today's uh, U.S. and West approach to Taliban-controlled Afghanistan when they are uh, uh, conditionalizing uh, the aid to Afghanistan with the uh, women's rights and ed uh, education over there? I think of it as a very minimalist approach compared to the maximalist approach of the Taliban. Because Taliban were very maximalist in limiting the rights of the Afghan. Right? Have they opened, have they allowed the schools to be open? We would have argued for more. We would have argued for work. Right? Have they kept the workplace open? We would have argued for a seat. But I think they were very strategic about that. And what they did was they went, they, you know, went right into the core of it and they banned it all so that now we can negotiate our way one thing at the time starting from education. And I think it has become, so essentially the Taliban is setting the agenda. It has become about that. I see all these conversations, you know, I, I essentially feel like the conversation about the Afghan woman has essentially become to getting them back to schools. And look at where we are 20 years after doing all these investments, you know? And why did we get where we got? Because the Taliban were very strategic about the way they, they, um, they started limiting. And all these different, uh, different gatherings I see in support of, you know, rights of Afghan women. And the first thing they all say is like open. And it's a very minimalist approach. And I feel like the right to education actually has nothing to do with a religious doctrine or with, like for that matter, any type of ideology. It's a basic human rights. So some, and, and there's also this other thing that I wanted to talk about that I've recently been thinking about is that I see, um, so the US clearly does not have a lot of leverage. Taliban is setting the agenda. And then also I see that in the struggle to find a pathway with the Taliban that we are trying to organize the Muslim community to, uh, you know, I don't know to, to, to do what, but I think essentially to, 
mobilize support for, for the Afghan woman in the context of religion. I see the point, it makes sense. But I think what they're doing is to Afghan woman is subordinating the cause of education to an ideology. And it's all just feeding into the agenda of the Taliban because there's an underlying acceptance of this, that we recognize your religious agency over Afghan woman. So that's why we are entering with you from the door of religion. You're seeing that, right? So. How does that make me feel as an Afghan woman? That we are looking for ways to make our arguments more credible with the Taliban. Where does that put us in the 21st century? And then we think of the Taliban as this, you know, all backward, tribal, this and that. Again, the oversimplification that um, ends up over determining. And I think right now, the way I am seeing the Taliban are seeing the agenda. Um, and I, as an Afghan woman, I'm very much distressed, you know, with that sort of like approach of like constantly uh, not having any leverage, first of all, losing all your cards, and then now starting from all the way down one thing at a time. Is that a question that's come in online? Like the good. Follow up to this. This is from Abdullah Hadzai. Thank you, Professor, for the great lecture. I think we can agree that the advancement of women during the last two decades cannot only be attributed to foreigners. Mm -hmm. However, we do appreciate the opportunities for the new generation of strong women, which were mainly made available through international interventions and funding. The question is what happens to this human capital of our new immigration now? Any role you see for the educated men and women to change this dynamic? <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I, I addressed that earlier and I appreciate um, intervention. I think throughout, I think what you're seeing is what is bold in my remarks, which is exactly what I want you, what I wanted to head there is, you know, these contradictions and misconceptions. But I think all of that it happened, you know, in a, in a field where the opportunities were obviously made as an intervention. I think that is that I have taken for granted and I'm not necessarily, you know, except the part where I see that as part of the doctrine of counterinsurgency. Um, I don't, I'm not necessarily, um, you know, I'm not denying that, I think that's a given, but I, but I, and I also answered this question earlier in a way when I said, you know, I want to give this generation some time because of the very personal experiences of Exile and refugee who the I have went through for the people who are in the outside. I think it's um, it's fair to give us the time to remobilize. And for I think for those who remain inside, I have to say that they need to be engaged, and that the mistakes of the past shouldn't be um, repeated. Because if there's one thing that I think it's not that all the human capital that we had built in the past. Um, I think thousands of educated youth still living in this country. Um, and I believe that in any, and, I, and at times I don't even feel like I have the authority because I don't live in the country anymore. I don't have the authority to talk on some of them. I feel like they are the one who need to be reached, who are living under this region, reached out to and asked, you know, because I am, I am, I, now I am exactly in the same position when I was when I was inside the country where I felt like I need to be asked what's going on because I'm living. Um, so I do encourage, you know, reaching out uh, to um, uh, not only reaching out, but essentially embedding, you know, the human capital in the, the aid economy that is in, in, in play inside the country still. So that we can hopefully avoid some of the, you know, mistakes and misconceptions that haven't really, uh, that ha that fed, you know, the, the past twenty years of, um, uh, of um, failures that we have seen. So I'm definitely encourage. Just like a related question, and again, we'll come back to the the live events here. Um, are there similar contradictions in um, uh, assumptions about empowerment and agency when you see assistance to Afghanistan and to Afghan women coming from non-Western supporters? 
Mm, that's a good question. Um, I think the leading supporters have mainly been the West, I would say. Um, not only in the past 20 years, but even now, you know, with all the humanitarian aid that's flowing inside the country, I would say it has been mainly led by the West. Um, but the other countries also view, you know, I don't think they necessarily view that in a bilateral relationship with Iran. Because first of all, that sort of a relationship is not even, does not even exist right now. You know, the Taliban is completely cut off. Um, for the right reasons. And so I think they view their relationship with the country in a more multilateral way, with the West leading. So it's the, so I think it kind of again puts the you know most of the responsibility on the on the Western shoulder, fortunately or unfortunately. And I ask that because I know India was a very substantial bilateral donor during yeah. that time. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I was very, you know, in that capacity of serving the Afghan government, I was very fortunate, I would say, to have, to have had, to have sat across the table from mostly all of us, from most of Afghan neighbors, you know, including India. Uh, but I think there's a lot of dynamics in play now with, you know, the Pakistan uh, dealing with its own domestic challenges, but also how their relationship is evolving with the Taliban. And I think overall, how you know the geopolitics of the region is changing. I think it needs to be looked at in a more holistic way. With, you know the war in Ukraine and with Russia. I think it's, there's always a very and you need to put, put a more holistic lens to it. So, uh, and then clearly because the bilateral relationships don't exist, I think everybody prepares for their own interests as well to deal with the Taliban in a more multilateral. And of course, in the context of their, you know, prioritizing their own interests. But we have a question. In the first row. Oh, I'm sorry. And we'll go. We'll go to you after. Um, good morning. My name is Vanessa Duvalle. I'm a second year master's student here at the Elliott School. Um, thank you so much for your comments, for your, for your insight. It's been very valuable. Um, I'm struggling with to articulate my question. It comes from, from a little bit of a development perspective, right? I guess I'm struggling with um, thinking of what the practical solutions to this are. Like, how do we alleviate the impact, right, of these contradictions that you've described at this point? Because if there's no going back in the past and, and fixing our approach, right, without the appropriate historical and, and societal or even political context at that time. Um, but how do we engage um, with local community, with local Afghan women, um, and how do we support them in regaining their agency um, without, right, feeding into these contradictions that you described? The agency is there. That's my first response. You know, I think agency was is a property, an omnipresent property. That, again, I told you earlier that it's doesn't necessarily always connect with well-being, but I think it manifests in the choices we choose. And back home, every woman still continues to make decisions in the very complex context. So I think agency is there. We need to acknowledge it, but also view empowerment more from a perspective of helping expand it helping expand their ability to make better choices, to how to turn that agency into well-being, you know, and, and into choices that will lift. I think that certainly I I would say should be at the top of, you know, even in the back of consciously we should, you know, all try to practice that and be engaged with it. And then um second, I think it's um you can't really take the issue of women. It's as much of a political agenda as anything. I think the issue of Afghanistan, as much as there's a lot of humanitarian focus now for the right reasons, I think the situation needs to be, the situation can only be adverse to a political uh, situation. Because of human, I, I think the humanitarian 
element of it. What it's doing is it's actually doing, you know, not necessarily intended in, in an unintended way. It's actually feeding into the agenda of tolerance. And we are essentially doing some of their work on their behalf in flowing all this because they are, they are you know, the, they have a role in why the economy collapsed. And if they claim themselves as a de facto government right now, I think they need to do their part then in running that government, which they are not doing. Um, and I think, and in viewing the Taliban also as, you know, these, passive, not necessarily active warriors, we are also doing a mistake of it. We're essentially applying the same lens of in that we're applying to the foreign. Um, that we are that we are not recognizing the strategic capabilities of the Taliban the way we should in having to deal with them. Because you can't really you know view them as the backward as if you're a tribal group of people who only know how to exercise violence uh, but then also you know expect them to not necessarily do their part in running the government um, so I guess that sort of like applies and then uh, the other thing I would say is also and this like uh, this kind of you know makes it very takes us away from from the focus of this lecture but I mean this whole issue of um, state building you know, and also state building states with a structure, with a notion of a structure that, you know, works in the West, that assuming that control, that the, that the state needs to have a hundred percent control on the society. Um, a very centralized form of running a government. I think these are all the things that needs to be, you know, as we try to, um, all find hopefully find a solution you know for the case of Afghanistan I think there's a lot of these things need to be done institutional um, uh, creating parallel institutions there was an entire parallel economy that was done in um, we had a state structure and then there was a parallel donor structure and then the moment it pulled out things collapsed so how do we not do that again how do we restructure the aid economy in a way that builds more local economic resilience, as opposed to you know flowing humanitarian money um, every day? I think these would be some of the questions uh, that I would urge you to think about. Solutions, there's no magic spell, and it has to be very um, needs to be looked into in a very way. Now we had a question just behind. Yeah. So um, first, thank you very much for a deeply insightful presentation. I'd like to ask you to revisit the question of women's agency in relation to the urban rural, uh, I'm gonna say divide, but I'm partly challenging you to, to improve on that. When you referred several times to the, <clears throat> the iconic photo of the, um, young woman with the blue veil, which I think of as first appearing on the cover of National Geo, uh, a publication which has a long history of essentializing uh, people and uh, as exotic others. But, um, but rightly or wrongly, I think of that woman as representing rural Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But in any case, you spoke of your your mother, your grandmother, as both um, uh, powerful and effective uh, women, and and made the, but made the more general point that that women's agency wasn't uh, an outcome of American intervention. That in the modern sense, you see it going back decades and decades. I wonder if you just would then elaborate a bit on how this played out in rural Afghanistan and how much of a, a linkage in, interrelation there was between urban and rural. Thank you. Um, that's a very, very provocative question because <laughs> this whole urban-rural divide 
I love to talk about it, you know, because I think this, I, I have a lot of problem with the, the dichotomy, with juxtaposing women against each other. You know, I haven't heard of like men being divided into zero. Um, it has always been women, you know, urban women. But I think for me, um, I think an individual conception of freedom is important. And that's what exactly I mean when I talk of age. That schools needs to be open. The opportunity should be there. Now, you know, I've received a, um, when I've made this point, you know, some people have told to me that this, this is not necessarily a healthy way of saying it, but I'm still going to say it because, I, again, I say agency doesn't always necessarily connect to well being, but it's about being able to make a choice. So the school should be there. If a woman in a remote place in Afghanistan, for whatever reason, finds it not convenient to go to it, that doesn't mean that we should deprive everybody else of having the opportunity go to school. I think if anything we should encourage, we should first school should be open, but then we should also see how we can engage with that particular woman to see you know how we could expand her scope of agency and making a better choice. Perhaps with the woman in school, you know, or navigating whatever structure she's dealing with inside the house that doesn't necessarily allow her to go. Um, so I think for me, this entire um, urban rural dichotomy was more, again, um, a narrative that I felt was being projected on us by the West. Because we, amongst ourselves, we didn't necessarily, I mean, had this idea of like, who is an urban because as women in a complex society in Afghanistan, we very we have you very well know how to apply our identity to different contexts. I can very much be a rural woman. If a rural woman means I have to, you know, dress very um, differently. But I think I can I can very much be that woman because I'm going to be strategic about it. I'm going to be practical about it. If that is what's going to make me or going to allow me navigate that rural space, I am your rural. And I, and I think that's what we need to, uh, yeah, I hope I was able to, um, to answer your question, but I think we need to look a little deeper there. And again, understanding how Afghan women are products of these complex decades of you know, um, polit social, cultural, social, political but being constantly in motion of that constant We have uh, another interview. So this side and then this side. Okay. Good morning, and thank you for these uh, incredible perspectives and eye-opening ways of examining these issues, particularly from the vantage point of agency. And so I want to go with the uh, and expand from a practical sense on agency. I wholeheartedly support the idea of people in Afghanistan now being able to speak for themselves and set the agenda for themselves about how to address the current situation. From a practical standpoint, how would you suggest that might be carried out that also helps keep them safe from reprisal? for speaking out and being activists within the current context of what's happening in the country and how the exile community can help facilitate that process of empowering their voices and solutions for their own situation that they find themselves in while helping to also 
to the extent possible, help keep them safe in doing so. Thank you. I think safety is very, is a relative concept, you know, because, and this is something that hasn't really recognized the type of coverage that it should, that it should deserve, because again, it doesn't fit, you know, it doesn't really turn into that grief currency that everybody wants to invest on. But Afghan women have been marching, if not every day, you know, if not, um, on a weekly basis, but they have been watched. They have been demonstrating and they have been Despite all the safety and security concerns. And when I say safety is relative, and I've you know, personally spoken to many of these women, you know, who feel like they have no other option, that the world is shutting down to them. So I think in, in that particular point, then, safety becomes a relative concept and you make the decision of what's safe for you. Because you are somebody who is inside that hell and that you need to you know, get out of. Um, so I think, and I learned, I, I, this is not me, I learned this from a woman that I was speaking to with similar concerns, who told me, why are you making decisions of safety on my behalf? And I was blown away. And I said, this is exactly the generation that I think is much, they have a deeper understanding of their agency than I, than I have. That I, for a long time, I didn't consciously pursue it. But here is this young woman who has been beaten by the Taliban. She has been taken to the jail, but then she tells me, don't make decisions on my behalf. But just help me elevate my voice in whatever ways that you can. We are not receiving coverage on the work that we are doing right now. So I think it's, and I, that, that's why I also engage very much inside uh, Afghanistan, you know, with these women who are at the forefront of this fight, alone by themselves, you know, and while they are fighting this fight, we are again, you know, putting them inside these rooms, talking to them, and then take, taking pictures and putting on Twitter and saying, we will bring back your rights at home. No, she's already doing that. You know, I think the least that you can do is perhaps, you know, take that picture, include more women in that room to show that Afghan, you know, to show that political agency can exist both for men and women, that we're having political conversations with a mixed group of Afghan men and women to show the agency of that generation, but to also say, you know, this is what we learned from the Afghan women. And this is because in some of the, you know, I hope to be in some of these conversations. I unfortunately cannot go back. You know, I wish I, I, we do that over, you know, phone calls, Zoom calls. But to, 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 be, to have the luxury of being inside Afghanistan and then coming out of it and again tweeting saying, we will help bring back your wife home. I mean, give me a break. Right? That's how I think. Um, so that's why I feel like our international partners also have the luxury of being able to travel. And their takeaways should be more from those travels than just a tweet saying, we'll bring back your rights home for you. Yeah. I have a question over here. Uh, Hi, Professor. Um, so the term Afghan woman in and of itself is pretty general. There's Hazara woman, Pashtun woman, Tajik woman, Uzbek woman. Has the struggle or the strive for female uh, autonomy and agency been a uniting uh, experience for Afghan women? And if not, in what ways is the overall um, struggle for agency vary from community to community within Afghanistan? Um, thank you, Nicole. That's a if I answer that, I think I'm going to not risk a lot of things, including a political future career that I still hope to have. Um, so see, the Afghan woman here is making tactical decisions on, on how to <laughs> I think you have, and um, Nicole, you were, you know, Nicole took my class last semester, and Nicole, I'm very proud to see, you know, that you, um, the, the nuance and your understanding of uh, of these concepts and, and Afghan woman. I think um, 
you're very right. Um, I told you at the beginning of this conversation that it was not easy for me to do this um, because I because I I am doing this for a Western audience and I'm putting this and I'm putting myself in a position where I also am adopting my language and I'm also picking my battles. So my and I think I don't really want to go into for this particular conversation. You know, I see the appetite. Is this time for me to go and divide Afghan women between Hazara, Tajik, Pashtun, and then, you know, which you're very right. They all have, you know, they all come from different backgrounds, unique situations, you know, the um, uh, unique backgrounds, and also they're, far, far, they're, they're, they do not, they're not necessarily characterized in a unified way, which again, I think of it as something positive because that is the very characteristic of the rest of it. But I think for the sake of the conversation, I chose to. Um, use that term uh, because it's widely acceptable for the um, Western audience and it's not my priority right now. Thank you. Let's take, we have one last question here in person. Yes. Left. Um. Thank you for the lecture, uh, lecture first of all. Uh, my name is Son Ho Kim. I'm a first year MAIA student in LA school. And um, as a person from uh, South Korea, which is about the country, was on their col uh, colony of the Japan back in the day. And one of the um, prevailing concept of the, uh, for the justification of the colonization was um, Korean people were not able to stand on their feet, you know, by themselves. That's why we need to help them. Um, it's still a prevailing idea when they, uh, when some of the people in Korea, when they think about the modification, back in the day, they still say the same thing. Um, but my uh, my question was, what would be some of the good question as a person try to help help other country to liberate or find their empowerment or agency? What will be the good question to ask themselves before actually doing some of the action or while doing this intervening um, thing, intervention, yeah. Thank you. Um, that's a good question. And I think I also, you know, I, I, when I, for my students, when I teach, I always tell them, you know, I, I encourage you to not only look at the lessons learned, from these different episodes of intervention in the context of the host countries, but also to look at it from you know a little bit of soul searching from your own perspective. In, in what exactly were you doing? Was it required for you? Because I think the way you know I've noticed even the foreign um, relation curriculums. You know sometimes when they are organized in in the powerful countries like the US, you know, there's all, already an underlying assumption that we are going to be an intervening country, so let's learn how to intervene. And then, so then a lot, a lot of focus is on the, what are the how do we best intervene? While for me, I think I want, I encourage everybody to take a step back and also look at the, the, the repercussions of, because these, these inter, you know, as we saw it in this latest episode of Afghanistan, it wasn't that, you know, this particular episode only had its effect on Afghanistan. It has also been shaping the dynamic of some, you know, domestic political conversations here in DC. So I think it's, you know, and I can clearly see that happening. And I also see a generation of my students, you know, here at the Elliott School, who are also, you know, they're, they want to know why so much intervening? Is there a different way that we can do this? You know, so I think it comes back to all of us as educators, you know, as policymakers, as politicians to look at both sides of the coin, not necessarily just on, you know, just, pro pro just come, just projecting it from a place of superiority and assuming your interventions always makes 
the life of other people. Have just a couple minutes left, um, so I'm going to ask you what words of advice. I, I know you are teaching here now at the Elliott School, and we're grateful to have you here. Um, you taught previously at American University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. What words of advice would you have for that generation, that rising generation? Uh, I know that the American University is very uh, open and they're trying to promote this. I'm still trying to do what they can. And I unfortunately haven't been able to take classes with them because everything is happening. But I think I, I would like this generation to share my stubborn hope with them. And I sometimes think I don't even really have to tell them, you know, what to do because in some of these conversations I've had with some of the students from the American University or particular woman that I was talking to, I feel like that their perspective of the world is much more nuanced, you know, and, and then the, than, than even my generation. But I think the only thing that's important is to still be able to keep your hope and believe in the idea of an Afghanistan that we all want to live in, that we all um, hope to be part of. And I think I as difficult as things are looking right now, um, I think I have that hope um, when I was in that. That's the only thing that I have right now you know, to share with that generation. And of course, my, you know, that every opportunity that I get, that I also hope to share my experiences and that to transfer these experiences, you know, so that hopefully some of the mistakes that my generation made those will not also repeat it. Thank you. Let's bring this to a close. That was a very, very sobering conversation. Uh, but thank you for your presentation. And we do have some refreshments in the back, so we'll invite everybody to have coffee or a tea and spend a little bit of extra time with us. Thank you, Dean Ellis. And thank you, everyone, for joining online.